Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, key senators weigh in on the future of the Met Council, the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project, and the scheduling backlog for first-time drivers. Plus, lawmakers look into the delayed opening of an apartment complex that has left college students without housing. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Last session, the legislature formed a task force to evaluate options to reform and reconstitute the Metropolitan Council, a regional taxing authority, planning agency, and provider of services like sewage, parks, and transportation in the Twin Cities. Joining me in the studio to talk about the task force, the latest with the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project, driver's license testing backlogs, and more, is the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, Scott Dibble. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Shannon, and happy birthday to you. Oh, thank Thank you. Uh, the unofficial state Senate fair opinion poll results indicated that nearly 58% of poll takers think that the Met Council members should be elected rather than appointed. 24% opposed and about 14% were undecided. You are the co-chair with Representative Frank Hornstein of the Metropolitan Governance Task Force, a group charged with determining the future of the Met Council. Is change inevitable? Well, um I was glad to see the outcome of the survey. I don't think it's a scientific poll necessarily, but it's a strong indication that people are aware um, that this is a unit of government, a level of government that probably needs a stronger connection to the public that it serves. Some more accountability, some more transparency um, as a way to drive better outcomes. There's been a lot of problems at the Met Council People are probably most familiar with the cost overruns and the delays to the Southwest LRT, but that's probably part and parcel and a function of a larger set of cultural issues that give rise when an entity like this has so much power and authority. They literally control a budget uh, in the billions of dollars, um, and they have taxing authority, like you mentioned. Uh, they, have, they can supersede local units of government land use authority. They can tell a uh, local unit of government in their comprehensive plan and their zoning regimen to change that. Um, and th you know, that's probably, in, in some analyses, an illegal delegation of authority to a non-elective appointed authority. And people sense that. And this subject has come up uh, time and time and time again over the last 20 plus years. And there have been no less than seven task forces, blue ribbon commissions, et cetera. Maybe this time's the charm. Um, the, Legislative mandate is to disallow looking at superficial solutions and really look at fundamental structural reform. Um, and so we're, we really are, I think, trying to do um, not just the deep dive, but a, but a broad level of engagement with the public and stakeholders who aren't already there to uphold the status quo. Um, and again, like I said, this has come up so often and we can point to real improvements that are needed that, yes, I think if, if this doesn't cause change, we'll just be right back at this same table having this conversation in a year. So something's got to happen. And as you mentioned, the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project is likely the item that most Minnesotans are aware of in terms of cost overruns with the Metropolitan Council. DFL Representative Brad Tapke is planning to introduce legislation that will change the agreement between Hennepin County and the Met Council to deal with paying for the cost overruns. Right now it's 55% Hennepin County, 45% Met Council. So there's the budget shortfall. There's an agreement to try to figure out how to pay for it. There's also a potential settlement with the Cedar Isles condominiums in the Kenilworth Corridor. So as this thing continues to go along, how would you like to see the situation resolved? So I'm probably not going to get dive into the you know, specifics of uh, Representative Tabke's proposal, um, you know, and who and how should pay for the damage that's been done to these condominiums by the construction, et cetera. Um, I'll just step back to the, my response to the previous question. This, this is what happens when um, there is an entity um, that exists in a vacuum and not in conversation and not in deep relationship and not with a level of accountability and transparency with the public and the stakeholders that it serves. This, this deal um, that Representative Tabke is looking to remedy was hatched in a basically private conversation uh, held with, amongst bureaucrats. 
um, no elected leaders, and it would purport to control and move hundreds of millions of dollars in public money um, without any sort of an appropriation or deliberative or debate process. And it was just announced in the form of a press release. Um, you know, and it was connected to an uh, apropos of, of nothing. Um, and of course, they immediately ran into a bunch of criticism and static from various interested parties and stakeholders. These sorts of things shouldn't happen. These kinds of, of decisions, especially when we're talking about appropriating hundreds of millions of dollars, whether that's regional sales tax, Hennepin County sales tax, or federal dollars, um, needs to be subjected to the appropriations process that only can be done through uh, organs of, of entities, legislative, deliberative bodies that are elected. Moving to another topic, I just went through the process of scheduling a road test for my 16-year-old son, and it was not easy. Um, appointments within the 30-day window of availability were hard to find and involved repeatedly logging in to try to find anything nearby. Uh, both Minnesota Public Radio and Fox 9 News have reported recently on similar parental frustrations. As you likely remember, the Republican-led Senate in 2020 passed a bill that would allow third parties to offer those road tests um, to alleviate some of the strain on the system, considering that there still seems to be some strain. Is it time to reconsider an option like that? I think anything uh, sh and everything should be put on the table. Um, and one of the critiques of that was that um, these tests will be conducted by the schools that offer the training, and so there's a conflict there. Um, you know, so you know, controlling for those kinds of conflicts, maybe we should look at that. But um, I will say, though, that I think we should first allow um, a, a series of changes that we put in motion this year um, to play out. The, the, believe it or not, the wait times have improved a lot. Uh, we provided more resources. That's the other thing is we haven't been providing the agency with the resources they need to be responsive to the public. Believe me, I'm aware. I get the calls from frustrated <laughs> constituents, um, and we've been you know, pressing the agency hard, but we've also been providing the resources. You know, they come back, as is the story, all across the board in a lot of both private and public sector services. Um, you know, employment has just been really hard. There's just not enough people to put into the jobs um, that need to be done. Um, so that's part of the problem. The other problem is they just haven't had the infrastructure, the support, the, the, the funds that we use to support driver services and vehicle services have been uh, very, very short. Um, and now we've got those resources in place. So I'd like to see what happens with the remainder of this year and into next with those wait times. And I will say we were able to get it done. It was just frustrating. Uh, on a related note, there is a new law that is taking effect in October that will allow an estimated 81,000 undocumented Minnesotans to get a driver's license. As a parent of a recently licensed driver, uh, I'm not sure that I could pass the behind the wheel test without some specific instruction and knowing what I would be tested on. Kids do have the behind the wheel training. Adults don't have to go through that. Do you think that that might be a problem? And to the best of your knowledge, I think as you sort of already referenced, is the Department of Vehicle Services prepared for this influx? Um, I don't think they're prepared. Um, I think they've acknowledged that um, and, and have, uh, in a, are, are, I think, have a plan to ramp up because there's going to be like, uh, like you know, the egg moving down the, the bow constrictor. You know, they know <laughs> there's going to be the surge that right. then is going to dissipate and they need to really ramp up and be ready for that. Um, in terms of training, I mean, I mean, that's the reason we have the road test. So um, hopefully, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad we, we have a stringent road test, make sure. And that's kind of the idea, by the way, behind letting everyone have a driver's license, make sure everyone who is driving mm -hmm. is licensed, has access to insurance, is capable of driving well, et cetera. It's all about the interests of public safety and also making sure that people are able to take care of themselves and their families, et cetera. So we have a just better, more secure community for everyone. Um, and so, um, you know, so the test will be controlled, but it might create a more bottleneck because then people have to come back and retake the test mm -hmm. and retake the test. And so mm -hmm. we did put some measures in that, um, that if people fail the test, I can't remember, X number of times, they have to wait a certain period of time before they come back. The uh, same is true for the written test. Um, you know, the written test is another, is right. another good control right. uh, element to you know, make sure that people have the, the knowledge of of the rules of the road and then of course the written test is the practical skills and the know-how that they can demonstrate so right. yeah i mean i think it's you know we're, we're headed for a, a little bit of a of still a, still a bumpy ride perhaps yeah, yeah but yes. uh, but i know the you know we've provided the resources and i know the agency is well aware and is trying to plan for those contingencies 
Uh, finally, before we go, the last legislati legislative session provided significant investments in transit and roads and bridges. As you are no doubt preparing for the next legislative session that will be here before we know it, what are maybe one or two priorities that you know that you want to tackle? Well, it's really going to be um, looking at the kind of the implementation, implementation aspects of these new resources that we put on the table um, and making sure that, that um, what we're doing in terms of planning for um, mobility and access and opportunity, that's what transportation means, of course, and, and also making sure that we're taking care of our environment, that the decisions we're making are connected back to um, where the need is the greatest, you know, so that people's lives um, are made better, um, that we're making sure that we're paying attention to um, those places where access is lacking and that we're connecting our transportation decisions uh, to positive environmental outcomes. And so um, so we have, a, we have like something like 20 or more implementation groups and task forces and, you know, and questions that we've asked the agency to go back and, and look at and answer. And, and so it's a lot of it is going to be implementation of, of various aspects. One key thing, of course, that people are very interested in is uh, safety on our transit systems. Mm -hmm. um, and we provided a, a surge of money mm -hmm. to really try to reset the climate and the environment and the, and, the, and the security and safety that people feel as they're riding transit, especially LRT. We really want to monitor for those results. Senator Scott Dibble, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. An informational hearing was called this week by the Senate Committees on Higher Education and Housing and Homelessness Prevention to learn more about the unfinished Dinky Town apartment complex that left a number of students at the University of Minnesota without a place to live. Many students signed a lease to live in one of more than the 500 units at Identity Dinky Town, which is a brand new apartment complex located at the old McDonald site near in Dinky Town. Its amenities advertised for this place included parking, in-unit washer and dryer, um, a coffee lounge, and study rooms. Most importantly, it's really close to campus, and it was set to open before the school term started, with most leases starting either the 27th, 28th of August, or the end of the month of August. Consistent with their lease, students paid their first rental payment on August 1st of this year. They found out the very next day via email on August 2nd that their place would not be ready in time. At that point, they were told that students could move in on September 15th and have recently found out that they will be moving in perhaps at the end of September or early October and have been assured multiple times that those dates are subject to change. Students were given two options and only two options. First, they could choose a $150 daily gift card and find their own housing. Second, they could receive an $80 gift card and be placed at a hotel that is somewhat close to campus. These options worked for some students who either had family connections or could find some place to live and receive a gift card. Um, for some students that, was a that had a flexible school schedule and other commitments, this has worked just fine and we've just provided advice on that issue. But for others, this is not viable and they don't really have other choices. The taking of rent before notifying the tenants that the building would not be ready was outrageous, especially because of how late in the summer students were being informed. Looking for housing in Dinkytown this late in the summer is a risky gamble, as most apartments and management companies have already filled up their units for the academic year and overpriced what they have left because of the location compared to our campus. When I signed this lease, I knew it would cost a lot of money, but I believe that my hard work would pay off since I would have somewhere comfortable and brand new. What's more inconvenient is the amount of money being spent on gas and finding parking. Since we didn't have a time to get parking, parking pass soon enough, all the spots were filled at the time. Another significant expense is eating. When you're waiting in between classes and don't have enough time to go home, you end up eating on campus, which adds up over time. Not being on campus makes me feel like I'm missing out a big part of my life, and living at home has been extremely lo lonely. Chair Fateh and I certainly agree that this is going to be a priority for us going into next session. We are committed to ensuring that renters and tenants, whether they're students or not, are treated equally and fairly in our housing system. And we'll be exploring you know, new legislation to ensure that every Minnesotan has a safe and stable place to call home.
Minnesota Public Radio and Fox 9 News recently reported that parents and teenagers are once again frustrated by a dearth of appointments for the required road test portion of getting a driver's license. Senator Karin Housley authored a bill in 2020 that would allow third parties to offer the road test, and she joins me now. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me again, Shannon. Your bill passed the Senate in the 2020 session, as I said, but it was not taken up by the DFL-controlled House. Remind us again of what the situation was. Um, well, we were right in the middle of COVID, and um, there had already been a backlog of kids trying to get their driver's license testing appointments, and then COVID made it that much worse, and uh, the department actually shut down some of their testing sites, so so it got even worse then because they didn't have, um, they wanted to, you know, keep it more controlled. So I had the bill. We do this with bus drivers um, for them to get tested. So I took the idea from that. That's allowed in the state of Minnesota to have a third party tester test our school bus drivers. And that took a bunch of people out of the system to backlog. And that, pro that program has been going smoothly. So I thought, why can't we just do this with our, our class D drivers test to take those kids out and have them go to third party testers, which would relieve a lot of the backlog. And you wouldn't have to be driving all over the state to get your driver's test appointment. So last fall, Driver and Vehicle Services enacted some changes to streamline the process, including shortening the scheduling window to 30 days. It had previously been six months. Uh, they also allow people to sign up for notifications when openings are available. So from my own personal experience, because I have a now 16-year-old trying to get his license, I put a note in my calendar 30 days in advance to sign up, and when I went online, there were no appointments available in the entire state of Minnesota. I eventually found one in the metro area, not my closest one, about a week after I was hoping for. Uh, but it was a process of constantly checking the website, and I know that I'm not alone. How onerous should this process be? It shouldn't be onerous at all, and your story is so, so familiar. We see it all over the news. Um, it should be an easy process, and the anxiety it causes the, the kid and the parent uh, it's worse than trying to get a Taylor Swift concert ticket because you're constantly logging into your computer and like, oh, let me see if there's an appointment available. Oh, no, not again. So this is, and parents are actually taking off work to do a four-hour trip out to Alexandria and back or up to International Falls. That's not government working efficiently. So uh, this this bill that I do have would actually alleviate that and it could open it up for more third-party testers, more testers across the whole state. So you wouldn't have to drive up north or out west to get your, your driver's test. Uh, taxpayers say often that they want the utmost efficiency from their government services. And for many services, there is a wait time. You know, it's not always like same day or right away for various services and programs. So a larger question perhaps is, what is the ideal level of availability and convenience that taxpayers should expect? And I, I, each, each department or each, each agency is a little bit different. I know when I had to uh, go through social security to get information after my parents passed, um, that took a long time too. But when it's something like getting a, a driver's license test appointment, that shouldn't be uh, out six months or you shouldn't be able to have to wait that long to be able to get in somewhere. And even when the department changed it from six months down to 30 days, so you couldn't get one six months out and then cancel it and then a bunch of these opened up, it still isn't working. So this is an idea just to propose, and again, we already do it with our school bus drivers, that why can't we do it for class D driver's test? So that's, and as far as, as government being efficient, you know, how efficient is government and what do we expect? It's, it's always slower than we want it to be. But when it comes to kids getting their driver's license, that's, that's pretty urgent. You've said that you do plan to reintroduce a bill uh, to do this, third party testers for class D road tests in the next legislative session. So would that mean that driving schools that specialize in training kids for their driver's licenses would be able to administer the testing? And how can we ensure that it's the same quality of testing and that you don't have the behind the wheel instructor actually proctoring the exam or any conflicts of interest? Is that, would, will that be spelled out in your bill? Yep, it is spelled out in the bill. Um, the driver's schools actually are not allowed to test their own driver's school students, so they would have to go to another third-party tester to get tested. And also there's language in the bill that 
they, there are audits and reports and, uh, and safeguards so that wouldn't happen. So we, we would make sure that those people aren't doing that. Um, and again, they're doing it with the school bus drivers and they're, they're driving our kids around. So um, I think it's, it's a great idea, long time coming. So I'm hoping since it did pass the Senate, um, there are Democrats on board in both the House and the Senate that would go for this. It's just a matter of it getting a hearing. Now, we talked about driving schools. Would it be possible that also deputy registrars could go through the certification to offer road tests or even the creation of new companies simply for this purpose? Is it is it kind of open ended how this might play out? It is open ended. And I think anybody that wants to, I don't know who would just want to start up a business just to test. Um, I think there's already people in the in the loop in that arena doing that. But yeah, absolutely. And they would they would get trained by the same people that are getting trained at the state to do it. So it's not like a different training for the third party testers than that, that's already in place. So they would have to go through the same thing. They would do the exact same test. And also when it comes to the driving schools, in in the bill there's language that the driving schools, when let's say they're testing somebody else's student, they still aren't allowed to um, administer the test on the same road or the same uh, route that they're doing their training. So there would be two separate testing and training. Uh, so that language is in the bill too, to make sure that, that we've got some oversight of it. Uh, let's just talk about cost for, for a moment. Um, as it stands, it's free the first two times you take your road test. If you're at third or subsequent times, you have to pay $20 per time. Would testing be free through a third party? And if not, does that set up sort of a two-tiered system where people with more means have better access than people with less means? That would be up to the third-party tester if they wanted to test for free. I, I'm not sure if they would or not. But still, if you take a bunch of kids out of the system or a bunch of people in the queue to get tested, if you take them out, that frees it up for everybody else to get it free. So that argument that, that the Democrats I know have been saying it's, it's, you know, is pay to play doesn't make any sense because you're freeing up a bunch more spots for everybody to get it free. Are you, um, as you prepare to reintroduce this bill, are there any changes to how it was introduced in 2020 or is it essentially the same and you'd just like to see it move forward? I would just like to have it get a hearing. Um, we had really great hearings when we had it in the Senate two years ago, or 2020. And um, I would like to have the department at the table to explain their fixes that they, they propose and have implemented aren't working at all. So this is all on them. And I'd like to get them to come forward to tell us what went wrong and why don't they wanna support this? Because it's best for the kids, for the parents, uh, for these kids wanting to get jobs, they to drive to their job. It's it really, really is a good idea. And again, we already do it with our bus drivers and everything is safe there. So I think it's worth giving a try. So I'd like to get a hearing. The language has stayed the same. Um, so hopefully come February, uh, the transportation chair Dibble will, will give it a hearing. Senator Karen Housley, thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon. Members of the Legislative Task Force on Aging held their second meeting this week and heard public testimony from advocates for older Minnesotans. We are powerful contributors to our economy and vibrant participants in our society for many years after we turn 65. We want to live in the communities of our choice and we seniors want to afford our homes be safe in our communities, have a transportation system that understands our needs, and above all, get the quality care that we have a right to receive. We are an enormous resource of volunteer labor, deeply engaged in our communities. Where I vote, most of the election judges are elders like me. We are very much engaged in the civic life of our communities. Ageism, though, tells a different story about us. We're dependent, we're in need of support and services, we're old and cranky, sometimes true, absent-minded, befuddled. As a result, we often feel patronized. We are old. It is a frame that implies that we are mentally and physically in need of caring and charity. Age is becoming, has become an arbitrary criteria for judging ability and fitness for a variety of roles in our communities, 
regardless of individual mental or physical capability. Ageism is not about who we are. It is a cultural construct that, like racism and sexism, serves to marginalize us politically, socially, and economically. I'm here today because our members are, con are contracting our board and officers expressing deep concerns about the fact that inflation is eroding the value of their pensions. The cost of living study required by the 2018 pension bill showed that inflation caused a significant loss in purchasing power over the, a retiree's lifetime. Healthy aging strategies for our rural 65 plus population is my passion, focusing on quality of life outcomes of purpose personal agency, social engagement and connectedness, activity and belonging. I would advocate that it is critical to identify these outcomes as our long-term aging outcomes for all aging work. For over two decades, the Minnesota Historical Society has offered the shadows and spirits of the state capitol tour. What will guests encounter on this tour? What we do is we recreate the historic lighting in the building as if you're walking into it for the first time in, early, in the early 1900s. And as you walk through these shadowy environs, you run into historical spirits or characters that would have been part of the stories of Minnesota's capital. On this tour, which spirits will guests encounter? Uh, there's a variety of different people from the building's past. For instance, Judson Bishop is a Civil War veteran who will tell his stories about his war experiences, and that's based upon those beautiful paintings of Civil War regiments uh, in the governor's reception room. We'll see uh, Clara Uland, who's a woman suffragist. Uh, she's talking about the right for women to vote and that, that march to getting that right eventually. And also in the Supreme Court, uh, where we're standing right now, we have the artist appears, and that's John Lafarge. She's the one who did these four murals that tell you the evolution, the changes of law throughout time. Does the tour cover the entire Capitol? It covers a lot of the different spaces that you would see on any regular tour. So we visit the rotunda, that's where the tour begins, go to the governor's reception room, go to the Senate, the House Gallery, get to see the chamber kind of from the bird's eye view, and then we come to the Supreme Court. What kind of feedback have you gotten over the years from people who've experienced this tour? Yeah, it's always very positive because you can come during the day to see our regular tours, and so you get one perspective of the building. But when you recreate the historic lighting, it really gives you a sense of what it would have looked like here 100 years ago. And uh, I think people are just thrilled to see these different stories being told, and it's really just a, a really fun way to look at the Capitol in a different light. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.